Welcome to What's the 411 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, how was your day today? It was pretty good. I got to spend some time with my nephew, Liam, and, uh, you know, I prepared for the show. And it was a beautiful day here in New York, so definitely was, was, it was a nice day for me. How about yourself? I got hit with a double whammy. Allergies and bad hair days. <laughs> it's been okay, but I'm here now, and I'm ready to talk to you guys. Oh, and I did break in my new running sneakers that I mentioned last week on the show. I'm pre preparing for a race, so I broke them in. Um, yeah, I'm still not ready to really run any marathons, but, you know, <laughs> they're getting some usage. So, Mike, let's get talking to sports. A lot going on. The NBA playoffs kicked off this weekend, and we are entering our fourth day of games. Mike, what are your thoughts so far? In the beginning, there really were a lot of lopsided games, a lot of 30-point games. The Golden State Warriors played the Rockets on Saturday. Same thing can be said for the San Antonio Spurs. The action's kind of picked up the last couple of days. Uh, a great game happened on Monday night between OKC and Dallas where there was a shot at the buzzer. Yeah. I think it was Nick Adams tried to get the Steven, Steven. Steven yeah. Adams and tried to get the shot off at the buzzer. And it didn't go. And right now, that series is at 1-1. One one. Uh, for me, the big series that I'm looking at right now is that OKC Dallas series and Miami. Miami played Charlotte on Saturday, and it looked really good. I don't think Miami is the type of team that can get out of the Eastern Conference. But there's something that really just, you know, I know Bosch is out, but I really want to see LeBron James go up against his old team. I think that that would be a really intriguing series to watch. So for right now, I think some of the excitement hasn't really been where it should be. We'll see some of that in the later rounds, but it has kind of picked up the last couple of days. Yeah, as you mentioned, the five out of the first eight games played in the playoffs were won by a margin of 20 points or more. So that left a lot of snooze fest for me because I don't like blowouts. It's not fun for me to watch. So, um, but as you said, as the games continue, you're starting to get a little closer margins. And, you know, after game one for the Warriors began ankle gate. Right. Steph Curry and his ankles, he left the first game in the third quarter with an ankle injury, and he did not play game two. It was more of, I think, a precautionary measure. Uh, Steph wanted to play, but I think in the end they decided not to, and he is going to be going for an MRI before game three, and so he's questionable. Even though it worked to the Warriors' advantage in terms of the game they did win, do you think it was a good idea to sit Steph? I think so. You know, this is a team that they're in the first round playing against the Houston Rockets. Let's face it, they're going to win this series no matter what. And I think that it's important for Golden State to make sure that he rests up. You don't want to rush him out there and really risk something major, especially since it's only game two. You know, it's it, it's still early in the series. Now, if this was later, in, you know, game five, game six, or something like that, or if it was in the second round of the Western Conference Finals, maybe you'd want to push him out there immediately. But I think that Golden State, they're being careful, and they should be, because this is a team that, as we all know, uh, they're, they're getting ready to go for a huge championship run and, and repeat. Yeah. I was really surprised when I was listening to analysts and pundits talk this morning, and some were really of the opinion that Steph should have played. And I, I couldn't quite follow why they thought that way. They have nothing to prove at this point. They're looking, the, the Warriors are looking for the long term, and the end, end goal is to win a championship. And look at looking at the Rockets on the floor, I, it would be a miracle if they did not get swept by the Warriors. So there's no need to expose Steph to uh, injury this early in the playoffs. And he has had ankle issues. So I think that it was wise for them to uh, sit him down. Uh, but before we uh, talk about some more basketball, but on the management side, uh, one series that I did like was so far is the Cavs and the Pistons. The Pistons really, of game one, really pushed Cavs to the, to the edge and actually were beating the Cavs and so it was really really good to see but I think in the end the Cavs have too much firepower because the, Kevin Love is creating a, a matchup problem for the Pistons so I think the Cavs will eventually win that series but I think Detroit will make it interesting. The NBA's Board of Governors approved a trial program which will allow teams to sell company logos to be worn on the jerseys. The program will last for three years and will begin effective the 2017-2018 season. Mike, what do you think about this decision? I don't like it at all. Uh, I really don't like it. I don't like by, 
they, they, there's so much marketing that they can do in the NBA. Uh, you see commercials and ads that they place, not necessarily on the court, but right on the side. And uh, it, it, it's for me, you can't put that on the jerseys. And I think immediately to the most famous jersey in professional sports. And I know that we're talking about basketball, but I'm just thinking of like a Wendy's logo on the Yankee on the <laughs> Yankee jersey. Like I know this is for the NBA, uh, but I don't like it. I don't like it at all, Keisha. I think that the, it really cheapens the game in a way. Uh, the Boston Celtic jersey, which to me is probably um, the most famous jersey or one of the more um, commemorative jerseys in the NBA. I don't want to see, uh, and I don't like the Celtics because I'm yeah. a Knicks fan, uh, I don't want to see any commer- any ads on the jerseys. I don't like it at all. And I know it's going to generate a lot of revenue for people, uh, but I think what it could wind up doing is, why am I going to go buy the Derrick Rose Chicago Bulls jersey if it has a logo or an ad on it that I don't like? Right. I, I agree. I think it cheapens the brand. It makes the players walking advertisements. And it also looks like the NBA is so money hungry that they're pimping out the players. Um, and I don't think the NBA has fully addressed the issue of potential conflicts of interest because a lot of stars and have endorsement deals. And what if one of the logos that they sell is in conflict with what the endorsement some of their players have? I don't know what's going to happen because contractually these players are bound to stick by products and not endorse any competitors. So I I don't know how they're going to handle that because I'm sure it's going to arise. And like you said, any revenue from these um from the sale of these logos is going to be counted as basketball related income and now it becomes a question of how is that money going to be split i mean they're already working on um in collective bargaining it's they're working on the splits on so you're adding another layer of that so who's going to get what percentage is it 50 50 60 40 how that's going to go so i think this is going to create more problems than what it's worth because this is not going to be a big money maker it, they're going to get money but it's not where they get their biggest chunk of money from so if you look at the nfl just real quick you know the giants they do have a commercial or not a commercial they have an ad on their jersey in training camp and there's as, as their practice jerseys throughout the season they do but for their game jerseys there's no logo there's no ad on their uniforms right and i feel as though there's other opportunities for corporate corporations to get involved you know for our hometown, the Madison Square Garden, Chase and Delta are all through the Madison Square Garden. Now, I don't know how much um, the NBA profits from that at all, but, you know, if they want to do something like that and where the NBA gets their cut, that, I mean, there's definitely opportunities for that. I mean, the NBA is still a brand that corporations want to be associated with, so um, we'll see. We they're, They've got another year or so to iron out all these wrinkles before... It goes into effect. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Staying with Harwood, we're going to do an NBA-centric uh, segment here. And high school graduate Thon Maker is aiming to be, um, he declared for the NBA draft. And he's looking to be the first player to go directly from, to the NBA from high school since the 2006 draft when the NBA banned the prep to pro rule. And as of now, the qualifications to enter the NBA is that you have to be 19 years of age and you need to be one year removed from your high school graduation. Maker makes these Maker makes. <laughs> Maker meets these requirements because he turned 19 in February and he's counting his year as at prep school as a postgrad year. Mike, if you know this is going to be allowed, do you think more will follow and what do you think? I think more will follow. I think that it gives an opportunities for players to develop and, and, and as opposed to going into college, they can go into prep school and develop themselves. Um, and I think that this could start a trend. Absolutely. There's no question about it. I think as far as what the NBA has done and the NCAA as far as setting up, well, the N- NBA has set it up so that you know the 19-year-old requirement policy, um, it kind of hurts the NCAA a little bit because you get these top-tier players that are just one-and-done guys. They go immediately in for one season and then they're out. Um, and that kind of hurts college basketball a little bit. Now, at the same time, with, with Thon Maker, I don't, 
and I'm not trying to be, fun, I'm, you know, put a pun on it. I don't know what to make of the whole situation <laughs> because I've never seen the kid play. And I think that the reports about this kid are, are really topsy-turvy. I've heard two, on one side he's going to be a top-five pick and that the Phoenix Suns are looking at the kid for the fourth pick in the NBA draft. On the other side, I've heard that this kid better get ready to get ready to play in the D-League because he's not yet ready to get it to be prepared for the NBA. Right. Um, I've heard also mixed reviews. I didn't even hear uh, as high as a top-five pick. That, that's news to me. Um, but I heard pick 40, second round, maybe not even at all. Um, I'm actually surprised that more people have not done this already. This doesn't seem to be a complicated loophole. And I was talking to uh, one of my coworkers who is familiar with the D-League and, um, and you know some of the circumstances in terms of the decision um, that he was going to declare um, was that this is you can do this post grad year. I thought once you graduated high school, then you're done. But you can go and uh, to a prep school for an additional year and go directly into the NBA. So I'm really surprised that this hasn't happened before. And um, I don't know if this by chance opens the floodgates. But I think the NBA will act because they s stepped in and made this. Uh, rule that you had to be 19 and I think if you get more of these high school uh, players declared for the draft and they're not quite ready I think the NBA will uh, make some adjustments to clamp down because they don't want their brand to be watered down and that certainly has happened over the last several years although you have seen some of these one and done players win championships look at Chile local for with Duke just two years yeah. ago yeah you know? so we'll see my new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff I wouldn't use this one he helps me with my decision making never and he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Well, Keisha, the biggest news in the NFL over the last couple of weeks was this mega trade between the L.A. Rams and the Tennessee Titans. Now, the Tennessee Titans had the number one pick, and they allowed the L.A. Rams to get that number one pick, and they've traded down to get multiple picks what did you? What was your take on this on this mega trade? The Tennessee Titans knocked it out of the park. This was all advantage Tennessee Titans. The Rams needed a quarterback, and so I think that's why they um, wanted to make the trade because they just don't have a quarterback that they can believe in. But the Tennessee Titans, in trading that number one pick and then two additional picks, they received six picks from the first two rounds of this year's draft, plus the number 140, 193rd, and the 222nd picks this year. And then next year in 2017, they will get additional first and third round picks from the Rams. This was a great move for the Titans. It gives them a chance to bolster their roster either through the draft or they can use those picks to trade elsewhere and you know maybe not pick up anybody from the draft. Draft picks are like gold. And so the the Ram, I mean the Titans, kudos. That general manager, I don't know what he did, but that wheel in a dealing was magnificent. The Rams, you know, they've been building through the trade over the couple uh, past few years because they were a part of the trade for RG3 to send him to Washington. So they've been building over the years, but I think they might live to regret the fact that they're going to be hampered and because they still have some some gaps, especially at the wide receiver tight end position. So um, they might want to use, you know, wish they had those picks. What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I thought the Titans did a great job. This is a team that's really been in the basement since, ironically, Jeff Fisher was their coach, who's now the coach of the L.A. Rams. Uh, but, yeah, the Titans, now you have multiple picks. You can build from the ground up. You've got your quarterback and Marcus Mariota for the future. So there's no question that this is going to be something over the next three, four, five years that they can build off of, without a doubt. Uh, for the L.A. Rams, you know, I think that a lot of people got on them for doing this. But when you move to the mega city, when you come into LA, you've got to have something that you can market. You've got to have something that you can sell, and they want that to be either Jared Goff or Carson Carson Wentz. We don't know. I don't know much about these two quarterbacks, but that seems to be what they're going to be going after is a rookie quarterback that you can sell to the people, so that you can get people to come and watch these games. As you pointed out, they don't have a quarterback. They need to have somebody, and this is going to give them the opportunity to get that guy. So I think overall this is going to work out pretty well for both teams. I think it's going to be a little risky for the Rams to to put all their hopes on a, a rookie quarterback, especially these two. There seems to be mixed reviews about both of them, and I don't think the reviews have been that they're 
that spectacular, but they're better than what's out there in, in terms of their draft class. So we'll see. Hopefully, it'll pay off for the Rams. And then another NFL news last week, the schedules were released, and we can look at all the rivalry games and all that and everything, but one of the stories that came out was the Seattle Seahawks social media account. They come out and they announce that all their, the, the, Seahawks 16 opponent, the Seahawks 16 opponents, are, as, or they refer to them all as cupcakes. What was your take on that? I thought it was in good fun. I saw the video on the Twitter page of the uh, Seattle Seahawks, and what it was, it was that they were baking cupcakes, and all the ingredients, quote unquote, were uh, things that were unique to their opponent's team, mascot, their locale, or something cultural. And so you mix them all in, and you put them up, and you get cupcakes. And the cupcakes had the the helmets of the opposing team, of the opponent, opposing team, along with the date that they were going to play. So I thought it was quite clever. Maybe because I am a foodie and I love cupcakes, maybe that is just clouding my vision and won't allow me to think that this is something more sinister than just a really creative way to announce the upcoming schedule. But I saw nothing wrong with it. But you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some coach took this, twisted it up, made their own version of this as poster board material. Yeah, I think for the Seahawks, they've underachieved the last couple of years. They talk a lot of smack, and they haven't backed it up. Remember, it was right here in New York when they won that Super Bowl. They smoked the Denver Broncos, and people were talking about a dynasty. They were talking about multiple Super Bowls, that this team with, with Russell Wilson, that they were going to go ahead. And what did they do? I know they lost a heartbreaker against the Patriots the next season. I was going to say, that game, was a questionable call. Right. <laughs> they could have had the second one. They should have won that, <laughs> and they didn't. Uh, and they talk a lot. You know, This is a team that does talk a lot. I didn't like the way that this whole cupcake thing went about, You know, especially when you got the Patriots on your agenda next season. They, so that's something that Bill Belichick will certainly use as bulletin board material. As you pointed out, though, it's all in good fun, and the season is like, what, five months away? So this is something that's not necessarily going to play a huge impact on what's going to happen in the games next year. Is it because you don't like cupcakes or something? I like, love this cupcakes. Is great. <laughs> I love cupcakes. I'm a big cupcake guy. I was wondering how I can get some of those cupcakes. <laughs> you know, my mouth was watering. I'm like, oh, these are good. <laughs> Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. We're going to stay with in the NFL news and we're going to talk about Johnny Manziel and Josh Gordon. These are two um, NFL players who have had their share of issues off the field. And um, Josh Gordon is currently serving a suspension for violating the league's substance abuse policy and Johnny Manziel has been cut and he was recently in the news for the wrong reasons yet again for allegedly trashing an LA mansion that he he rented. Mike, do you think that these two players are in, in trouble and these are cries for help and are we missing something? For Gordon, there's a lot of things I don't know what to make of it. Um, now, I think that there are some, obviously there's a big substance abuse issue there because the, he, you know, he really likes to smoke marijuana and he's constantly, constantly doing it. I think that there might be some other issues that I, I don't know what exactly is going on with this guy. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily cries for help or if he's just satisfied with his life and he says, you know what, I'm going to prioritize my recreational activities above playing football. So with Gordon, there's a lot of things that I can't necessarily pinpoint as to what's going on with him. With Johnny Manziel... It's not only cries for help, but this is actually like, this kid is so sick and he doesn't even realize it. You know, and the sad part is, is when you see him in these pictures with these people, these women and these guys that he's hanging out with, that are using him. They're using him for the limelight. They're using him for his drugs. You know, they're using him for his house. And, and it's just really disturbing. Not to mention in Texas on Thursday, the case that he had beating up the ex-girlfriend just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, uh, is going to be presented in front of a grand jury. So Johnny Menzel has so many things that he needs to be concerned about. He's in his early 20s, uh, and these are absolutely cries for help, but the only person that can help him at this point is himself, and he doesn't want to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the saddest part of, you know, talking about this story, is that you, it's like watching a, a train wreck or, or a car crash where you're watching, but you can't do anything to stop it from happening, and there's obviously something going on with both of them. Like you said, either it's substance abuse or some kind of mental breakdowns where they are making the wrong decisions. And as much as the NFL may want to help them, as much as their parents and, and loved ones may want to help them, it has to come from within. 
The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. While well, Brooklyn has found their man, Kenny Atkinson has been named the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets. He'll get to stick with the Atlanta Hawks as they make their playoff run. They're going up against the Celtics right now. But, Keisha, what was your take on the Nets hiring Kenny Atkinson? I was actually surprised about um, how quickly this announcement came after the season end, ended. So I was wondering if maybe they already knew for quite some time that they wanted Atkinson to... Uh, fulfill the the role. He has experience as an assistant coach. He does have San Antonio ties. Atlanta Hawks head coach Mike Budenholzer, with whom um, Atkinson works now, is uh, tied to Marks because they were both in the Spurs organization at the same time. Uh, the the reviews about Atkinson were rave from especially from the Atlanta Hawks players. Some of the things that were said about him was that he's a master of the pick and roll. He can communicate and simplify things for players he knows the game inside out and has a stellar reputation for player development and I think for this next team having a solid foundation in, in player development is really what this team needed so I think that um, it could be a good hire I I was expecting maybe a more splashy hire in terms of a Mark Jackson or a Jeff Van Gundy but um, from what I can tell this is a good um, good step in the right direction. Yeah, I like the fact that he's a Long Island native, so he has a New York pedigree. He has been an assistant coach with the New York Knicks as well. Uh, I think that the big thing for the Nets is now they can move forward. They can put the past behind them. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Phil Jackson, uh, he's got his hands tied. He, I, it seems to me like he doesn't know what he's going to do. The story was that possibly they're going to maybe bring Kurt Rambis back. Then there was the there was the story over the weekend that the, the Phil Jackson had reached out to his former player with the Lakers, Luke Walton, uh, and Luke Walton sort of shot him down and said he was not interested in the job. Now I both wonder part, why. Now both parties <laughs> are denying it, saying yeah. that that conversation never happened. People don't know what to make of it. Uh, my take on the Nick thing is that it's a mess right now. What's your take on the Nick situation and with their coaching position right now? I, you know, I think the fact that Kurt Rambis is still a strong candidate to have the head coaching position fuels my belief that Phil Jackson wants to be a coach, but he can't do it because of health reasons. So what better way for him to coach than to have somebody – who's basically going to be a disciple, his mouthpiece, to, to teach the world about this triangle offense and all, how great it is. Because, um, you know, I don't see why Kurt Ramos would still be a front runner. He has not done anything in his coaching career, much less this season, to say that he is better than a, a Mark Jackson or Jeff Van Gundy or some of the other people that are out there. Phil Jackson, I, I don't really mean to be disrespectful, not at all, but I just need to know, he needs to be tested because I can't figure out what he's go what, what's going on. He went so far as to say that the team was better without Melo on the floor. In what universe? What universe was the Knicks better without Melo on the floor? Maybe Melo, this is his wake-up call to finally break up with the Knicks, wave that no-trade clause, and get out of Dodge and, and get to winning because this is not going to get any better. And, you know, Phil Jackson, not to diminish his coaching accomplishments, but he was really blessed with a lot of talent. And he's struggling to build a team. And it kind of makes me wonder if he didn't have the talent that he did, because not everybody gets a Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and Scottie Pippen and Pau Gasol, if he would have had the same success as a coach. We're going to go over to City Field and talk about Mets pitcher Jake DeGrom. It's been a really rough week for him. He um, was placed on a family emergency leave due to unco um, complications uh, after the birth of his newborn son. And prior to leaving the team, he was nursing a sore lat. And it has been reported that his pitches have lost some velocity. He's said to... Uh, take the mound again, I think, this coming weekend. Mike, should we be worried about Jacob DeGrom, the Mets pitching as a whole? 
You know, the situation with the son, I think it's now getting better. Uh, that, that was, for me, the most important part, I think, because I was that kind of like, I mean, I'm not a Mets fan or anything, but just as far as from a, from a life standpoint, that was something that I definitely took some interest in because you want to make sure that the son is healthy and everything. Yeah. Uh, as far as him being healthy um, for the Mets, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that that's their strong point is their pitching. And coming into this season so far, uh, it hasn't necessarily worked out the way that people have expected. Um, it is still so early in this season, and we have such a long way to go. Yeah. Uh, but some of these question marks that remain, I think the big thing that the Mets need to be focused on right now is, you know, just worry about yourself. But when you look at the number one spot in the NL East right now, the Washington Nationals have really come out of the gates this season, and they've put them. They're going to put the Mets, push the Mets to the limit. There's no question about that. So. I think that people should be somewhat concerned about the Mets pitching, but since there's so much talent there, things will work their way out. The Mets are going to be in the hunt no matter what, and they will compete for a championship this season, I think, as, as people expected at the beginning of the year, which was just two weeks ago. Right. I mean, I don't mean to press the panic button or anything, but like you said, coming into the season, pitching was the Mets' strong suit, and I've watched a couple games where those pitchers have got rocked for a hit, and it's put their team in a deficit. Either they weren't able to overcome or they, they did. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that everything will uh, work out. But, you know, you, you want to come out and start the season with a bang, or at least not at 6-6, six and six, which the Mets are as of today. Mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner oh. soon. Please. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. I hope you have your pen and paper, your smartphone, your data recorder, press pause in the DVR to get those things because here are the events that are happening in our pipeline. Well, the NBA playoffs will continue and they'll be going for a couple months. And then on top of that, for the weekend of April 22nd to April 24th, the Yankees will host the Rays and the Mets will be in Atlanta playing against the struggling Atlanta Braves. Okay, also on April 28th will be will begin the NFL draft. So we can see where some of these guys that we talked about fall. Also, the N WNBA season is approaching and on April 28th, the New York Liberty will hold their media day. And on May 17th, ESPN will launch a multimedia platform where we'll discuss race, sports, and culture. Well, Mike, this is the time where we have to say goodbye to all of our friends. But don't worry, you can keep up with us until we meet again next week by following us on Instagram and Twitter and liking us on Facebook. Also, subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 411 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Thank you for joining us this week, and we look forward to seeing you next week.